Okay, there are 30 of us present. I think I'm going to start in respect for those who are punctual and have turned up at five, at five o'clock. Um, first of all, a big thanks to everyone who's replied to our invitation to hook up with us and find out what it is to become a Normandy ambassador. I must first uh, present myself. My name is Michael Dodds. Um, I am director of Normandy Tourist Board and I am also director of Normandy Attractivité, which has this uh, noble mission of trying to develop Normandy's image and reputation at home and abroad. You can detect by my name and by, by my accent that I am British, or at least Anglo-Irish, the Irish, which is quite important at the moment, post-Brexit. But I've been living and working in France in the field of marketing and tourism for nearly 30 years. So I feel that I've, I've got the t-shirt, but um, I'm still discovering new things every day about the French system and the joys and tribulations sometimes of working and living in France, which has been a fantastic experience. Just, there, there are 30 of us with us this evening. Um, just for the comfort of everybody, it would be great if you could just cut your microphones to uh, make sure we've got a clear sound. You can use the chat line uh, anytime you want. And I've got colleagues who'll be looking at the chat line if you have any questions that you want to raise in the course of our little presentation. But um, please don't hesitate to uh, use the chat line or raise your hand uh, and we will try and observe that and uh, try and respond. Um, yes. I'm expecting this to be together for about just, just, over, just over an hour, if that's okay with, with, with you. We've got plenty we want to show you and that we want to discuss. I want to start though by just presenting members of the Normandy Attractivity team. Um, one key person at Normandy Attractivity is my good friend and colleague, Emily, Emily Bonney. I don't know if Emily can just wave hello. Are you able to Hi. say hello? Hi. Emily is a very important person. She is responsible for running and coordinating the network of Normandy ambassadors that we have been trying to develop across the world. And so Emily, in the future, I hope, will be an important point of contact for those who are interested to join us and to join the ambitions of Normandy Attractivity and the Normandy brand in the future. So Emily is a key person. Other members of the team who are also very influential, Benjamin is with us today. I don't know if Benjamin can say hi. Nice to meet you. Hello, everybody. Uh, Benjamin is responsible for communications, everything to do with publicity and promotions for Normandy Attractivity and dealing with the press. And then someone who's very important, who's helped get this webinar off the ground administratively and technically is Mathilde. You say Mathilde in your, in your best English accent, Mathilde, say hello. Oh. <laughs> Go on, say something, Mathilde. No. Oh. <laughs> That'll do. That'll do. Anyway, there's also, I don't know if Chris is with us today. Is Chris, Chris McMahon yes. from, Chris say hello, will you? Hello there. Um... Hi, really, really happy to be here. Uh, and thank you, Michael, for reaching out to uh, Britline for, for this event. Britline, who, as you can well imagine, are a, an, an important and very valuable sponsor for, for Normal Day Attractivity. And they're encouraging us to reach out to, to the British community living, living in Normandy. So thanks, Chris, for your, for your help um, as well. Um, thank you very much. I've, I've always felt that um, there's a, um, a real potential for the expats of the region uh, to be actors in the development of, of that region. And so this, this, this event is, is perfect for me. Okay. Uh, let me just explain what, if, what we want to do this evening. If, if my uh, PowerPoint starts working, oh, it's gone to sleep, I can't believe it. <laughs> It's gone to sleep. Now, why is that? Oh, yeah, very much. Yeah. Tested it all twice beforehand. Anyway, never mind. <laughs> um, obviously, uh, I want to offer a big welcome to, to, to you all. I want to explain uh, what we're trying to do, our aims and our ambitions, and who we're trying to target, and uh, 
the rationale behind this exercise. I also want to talk to you very quickly about tourism in Normandy, which is an important angle of our activities. And I have a colleague, I think Ben Collier may well join us later on. Yeah, I'm here, Are you there? Say hello, I'm Ben. <laughs> Good afternoon, everyone. Now, Ben is a rare bird. He is someone, I come, my hometown in, in, in Britain, in the UK was Brighton. So you can imagine how tickled I was to discover a member of the team who'd spent half his life in Brighton and half his life in Dieppe. That's more it. more bilingual and bicultural Anglo French you ca you cannot find, and Ben is in charge of all our tourism promotion efforts to the UK and English speaking markets. And I thought it would be interesting to see to, for Ben to spend five minutes with us explaining what we're trying to do tourism wise in a very difficult context at the moment, as you can well imagine. Um, so I wanted to talk a little bit about tourism. I also wanted to talk about our first efforts to try and cope with the not just the COVID situation, but the Brexit situation, and to talk about the importance of maintaining and developing links between Normandy and England in the future. Because I don't know if you agree with us, we feel that those historic links are oh so precious in a post-Brexit environment. And something that we want to encourage Normandy region to develop and not let go. So we have a number of ideas that we want to discuss with you um, about how to maintain and develop links. And, continue to promote Normandy as a destination that offers a special welcome to British investors, to British students, to British visitors, and maybe for people who want to simply, you know, like yourselves, start a new life on the continent, thinking that Normandy is probably a logical and best place to start. So let me just start by explaining to you what we're trying to do. Um, 2016 was a fairly important year in terms of the French administrative map, the boundaries of the regions were redrawn. And something that was blindingly obvious for everyone outside Normandy, but perhaps, perhaps less obvious for those living and working in Normandy happened, which was the reunification of Upper and Lower Normandy. As I say, when you talk about Normandy to people who don't live there, what do you mean there was an upper and a lower Normandy? People just don't understand that uh, two separate administrative entities existed. But it's a fact of life. Uh, people were born and raised to almost live in suspicion of people who live on one side of the Seine and the other. And since 2016, the regional council um, became a unit, a unity and has been working hard on trying to federate, is the French term, but unite. Uh, Normans on either side of the Seine and to develop Normandy's image and <coughs> reputation. Behind me is a little a little logo device which says Norman, a multicolored, almost like a united colors of Benetton Normandy to illustrate the diversity of, of Normandy. That was originated in 2016 by the Regional Council who felt the need to basically help stop Normandy working on either side of the Seine get them working together and get them trying to, to combine their efforts to promote a, a unified and dynamic image and identity of Normandy abroad. Normandy wants to promote itself as a world region. Now, I had been working in Brittany beforehand, nine years running a tourist board. I was persuaded to come to Normandy because the mayor of Deauville, who is president of Normandy at Activité, the agency that was charged with the responsibility of developing this brand exercise. He said to me, Michael, we want to promote Normandy as a world region. And I said, well, what's that? I've never heard of a world region before. I've heard of world cities. I suppose that we're well placed in between two world cities, London and Paris, but I've not heard of a world region before. And Philippe Auger from Deauville said, doesn't matter, Michael, we'll invent it. We'll invent our own world ranking of regions, but we want to promote ourselves more strongly and a bit more aggressively. We want to develop our international reputation and Normandy feels it's credible because of its worldwide notoriety. Of course, the Second World War gives it an international notoriety and reputation. And of course, William the Conqueror and all that followed has marked, uh, has left its legacy in, 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 in the UK, which is still visible today. 
um, we still pride ourselves on the fact that the Queen of England is referred to in the Channel Islands and in Normandy as the Duke of Normandy. Very strong historical links that we want to develop upon. But beyond knowing of Normandy, beyond being able to situate it on a map, the question is, do people from abroad really know what Normandy is about and what Normandy is doing today? It's known for its history, but it's not known necessarily for its equestrian tradition or its innovation in the digital world or in the world of health and new technologies? Is it known for its agroalimentaire and its um, food products, for its cheese perhaps, for its calvados perhaps, for all its cider, maybe not. The idea came through that we need to promote Normandy more strongly for what it's doing today. The idea came through as well though, that we need to have a more concerted approach to attracting people to Normandy, not just visitors, but also companies, also people with, you know, with real talents, with people who are entrepreneurs who want to actually establish um, new businesses here in Normandy. And ambition has been developing this last few years since the reunification in 2016 to try and be a little more assertive in the way Normandy promotes itself. And that's our role. We've created a little 10-man team which is trying to convert this notoriety into image and reputation both at home and abroad and encouraging the Norman people to be a little less reserved and a little more outgoing and a little more affirmative in the way they talk about their region and being more positive. We're saying that Normandy, behind that brand, the Normandy image, the Normandy name, we like to think there are people who have very strong values. We like to think that the Normandy region and the Normandy population are very open to the world. Ever since the Second World War, they've been open to a form of tourism that is unique in the rest of France. And whether we like it or not, there are visitors from all over the world that come to visit outside this COVID period and the world, which we saw in 2019, the, the wealth and breadth of visitors internationally is quite phenomenal. With its main tourism draws of Mont Saint-Michel, Etretat, Giverny, American, Japanese, Chinese visitors, the, the breadth of different nationalities coming to Normandy is quite breathtaking, and even more so than in other regions of France. But we want Norman people to have pride in their region. We want to encourage them to sort of share their enthusiasm for the region with others. We want them to be, the French word is Normandie, conquérant. They want to be bold. They want to, we want to celebrate uh, the, the, the audacity and the boldness of Normandy enterprises and Normandy youth in different shapes and form. And ecological and environmental issues are very sensitive and important in Normandy. And we want to promote businesses and a general value of commitment to sustainable development. These are all universal values that you could say any region in France could lay claim to these values. But we feel that in Normandy, they're particularly strong. And because of the legacy of the Second World War, there's this notion of liberty and peace, which is encapsulated by this I think you've probably all cottoned on to the fact that the last three years, Normandy has organized a, a World Peace Forum in Caen, La Baie aux de, aux Dames in, in Caen. And we feel that these values are universal values that we want to associate with Normandy. Uh, and we want to try and promote Normandy as a permanent artisan for peace. That is the legacy of the Second World War. And that is the legitimate way in which Normandy wants to develop its image and its reputation as a defender of these universal values. So that's all very well, and that's all very ambitious, but what are we trying to do? We're trying to unite Normans so that they become active promoters of their region. History has probably left them. They've been invaded so many times that perhaps they've not been too keen to be uh, actively promoting their region. This is changing. We're trying to change the communication culture so that people are more positive and more assertive about their region. We want to promote ourselves as a world region and in France and abroad, that is doing good for the world, that is trying to make an impact on the world in various shapes and forms. We're trying to stop, we're trying to stop, and this is a very French phenomenon. We're trying to stop people from living and working in fairly closed communities or on a very 
sector-based network. We're trying to encourage people to network more generally across different economic sectors. The health sector work together, the aerospace sector work together, foodstuff sector work together, but do they work together in promoting normally? Not necessarily so. And that's what we're trying to do, create links between the different sectors and encourage people to have the same, sing from the same hymn sheet when it comes to promoting Normandy and reinforce its values and its image. We want to do that at home and much of the effort has been internal promotion within Normandy. But last year we ventured across the channel to the UK as well. And we felt that the that Britain's withdrawal, an official withdrawal from the European community on the 1st of January 2020, couldn't be left unmarked by a Normandy region with the special affinities and historic ties that we have with England and the UK. So a on a full page in the Times on January the 31st and on the back of the Evening Standard, we placed this image of Nigel Farage, even though we, we chopped off his head slightly on, on, on this image, but we couldn't help with our London agency but react to this real image in 2014 where for some reason, which we still don't quite understand, Nigel Farage sported a tie of the Bayeux tapestry as some form of symbolism as to when the last time Britain was invaded and pride that Britain has been, hasn't been invaded since. Fair enough. But we felt that we wanted to deliver a strong welcoming message to, the, to Britain to say that in Normandy, all right, you may have withdrawn from the European community, but you cannot let this situation undo history and geographical proximity and the very special links that exist between Normandy and the rest of France. And at a time where you're withdrawing from the European community, there's still more that unites us than divides us. That was a simple message. Some ties, play on word, some ties endure. And that was something that worked extremely well on social media networks, on Facebook, on LinkedIn, and on Twitter, and was used by many Normandy businesses to stretch out an arm and a hand to the British community and say, okay, there's a divorce going on, but we're still there to talk to, and we will always try and help, help you have a special welcome here in Normandy. Maybe this is just a start of something. This is something that gives us extra impetus to wanting to reach out to you, the British expat community in Normandy. We feel in this post-Brexit future, rather than just go quiet on the special links between Normandy and the UK, we think we need to shout about it a bit louder. And I'm sure that in the coming months, we'll be thinking of maybe different events and different types of ways of re reaffirming these special links and encouraging uh, British visitors, students, and businesses to carry on coming to Normandy. We've also, though, been focusing our attention worldwide. Uh, the Normans are not used to wearing a Normandy t-shirt. The Normandies are not used to wearing a, a badge with their famous lions, or they call the lions leopards in France. I think you've probably picked up on that on the Normandy flag. Um, up until recently, the Normans have not felt the need to, to assert that, but we have been trying over the last three years to encourage Normandy expats to, to stick together and actually promote the Normandy cause in their own professional efforts overseas. And the last three years, we've actually managed to create 21 clubs um, across Europe and in Canada, uh, but as far away as uh, Sydney and Australia, and Bogota in Colombia. And Hervé Morin, the president of the regional council, who, who's just had his mandate renewed for the next six, seven years, has always been a great defender of this cause, running official delegations with Normandy businesses overseas. And every time he's done a visit to China or uh, to Asia or to Canada or the, uh, America or to South America, he has also encouraged the creation of these clubs and invited myself to come along with him, accompany him and try and stimulate that Normandy pride abroad. And that's part of Emily's job, who I presented to you earlier, to keep in touch with that expat community and to feed them with interesting stories as to what's going on at home. People who join our network 
get fed with a, a twice monthly uh, e-magazine, which deliberately sets out to identify good success stories and, and positive stories about what's happening in Normandy so that the expats can keep in touch and can have, can also, you know, defend Camembert cheese, can defend Calvados, but can also talk about what's happening in terms of innovation by businesses in Normandy and have a, an eye out for opportunities for Normandy businesses overseas and abroad. We have also made an effort to try and create editorial content that can be shared on social media effectively, both by our network of ambassadors, but can also be used for more general purposes. So I thought it would be quite fun just to show you as an example, the types of videos that we uh, promote and we use, where perhaps some of the undiscovered elements of Normandy are given pride of place. As for an example, everything related to seafood and Puig Mer. I'd been defending Brittany as a center for French seafood for nine years. It was a great surprise for me in Normandy to find when it comes to scallops and the Coquille Saint-Jacques, uh, the Baie de Seine is actually even more important than all the different Brittany ports. And here's a little video which gives you some idea of the types of video, promotional videos that we produce. Allez, hop. Nous allons nous enfoncer dans la brume. Là. Nous venons de sortir de Grand Cambézi, on va faire une journée de pêche à la coquille Saint-Jacques en baie de Seine. On a de la chance, c'est parce que la zone est, est riche en, en coquille Saint-Jacques. Tout est en reproduction naturelle. Il faut essayer de, de faire au mieux pour protéger et pour, 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 pour que ça dure dans le temps. Ça y est, la pêche est, va débuter. On a quatre jours de pêche, lundi, mardi, mercredi, jeudi. Voyez, on a des heures bien précises. Aujourd'hui, c'est 14h30, 16h30. La main droite me dit. Donc, on a deux heures qui sont intensives parce qu'il faut perdre le moins de temps possible pour essayer de faire son quota. Et une fois que l'heure est en arrivé au bout, bah on stoppe. Et après, il faut travailler, calibrer. Donc tu vois, là, c'est la coquille qui fait 11 cm minimum. Donc ça, c'est ce qu'on appelle la coquille normale. Quand on trie, tu vois, ce qui, fait, euh, ce qui ne passe pas, c'est ce qui fait la taille. Donc ça, on le garde, la normale. Et là, tu as la grosse, ce qu'on appelle la grosse coquille qui fait plus de 13 cm. C'est une coquille qui doit avoir moins de 24 heures, qui est mise en caisse pour pas qu'elle soit écrasée, choquée, cassée, qu'elle soit bien euh, sur le dessus comme ça, c'est-à-dire qu'elle ne perde pas son eau, il y a une traçabilité. Et après, au niveau du, euh, au niveau du marayage, la coquille doit avoir un, un certain rendement. C'est-à-dire qu'il faut tant de, de noix au kilo, il faut qu'elle ait un beau corail. Mais c'est vrai que la baie de Seine, là, cette année, elle est vraiment magnifique. Euh, demain matin, la vente est à quelle heure 5h30. Ces coquilles, euh, elles vont remonter à la criée de Dieppe. Et puis elles vont être vendues aux enchères. Donc demain, c'est sur tous les étals. Le consommateur, il peut l'acheter et puis euh, régaler ses papilles. C'est quoi que t'envoies les gros, ça en Chauvigny, c'est vrai que c'est une des meilleures coquilles, voire la meilleure coquille du monde. Les, les meilleures coquilles du monde, um, just as we have les meilleurs bulots du monde. That's where I personally draw a line. I, I've got used to oysters, I've got used to uh, coquille Saint-Jacques. I haven't quite got used to Welks and, and, and Boodle. But um, hey, French cuisine and the Normandy cuisine is extremely important. And that's just one of hundreds of videos that we've been producing over the last uh, three years, trying to develop short videos, snappy videos that are both inspirational, but also quite educational, helping people to understand all the diversity and different facets of Normandy excellence little videos that work well on social media that, and that can, you can share with your entourage if you want to promote Normandy 
in the future. Now, let's see if my different slides can carry moving on. It's gone to sleep on me again. What was the next bit? I also wanted to talk. Uh, yeah. oh, sorry. Here we are. I also want to talk very briefly with Ben about our tourism efforts. Um, the British market is extremely important, as you can well understand. Hence, our frustration given the current situation in COVID, where I think, given last week and the latest events, we've almost drawn a line on, on welcoming British visitors this year in 2021. So our focus is going to be very much on 2022. But Ben, can you give us just a little steer as to how we go about trying to promote tourism in Normandy? Yeah, of course. Well, um, thanks for joining us, everyone. Um, my name is Ben. As Michael said, I'm a fellow Brit. I was born and bred in Brighton, but um, then my parents moved over to, to Normandy, to Jep, to be precise. So I wasn't too happy about that at the time. Of course, didn't want to lose and leave my school friends. But um, now I'm really happy and blessed to have these two cultures, these two identities, and to be working for the tourism board. Um, as Michael said, I mean, as you can imagine, the past year and a half has been really complicated, uh, but we've never given up and we'll never give up on the British market, you see. Um, the Brits are still the number one market, international market in Normandy for what we call nuité, which, is me which means nights spent either in the hotels or the campsites. So, you know, Brits are still coming over. They're still really important to us. And as Michael said, we'll never give up. We'll never give up. We'll keep on, keep on marketing as best as we can, best way we can, um, Normandy in the, in the UK. Um, but it's a great place to mark, a great region to market. Just to, Michael, we can come back to the previous slide. Just to, just to look at these, have a look at these photos. Let's begin with a bang. I mean, just, just have a look. It's, it's beautiful. Uh, we have Honfleur, we have Giverny, the Mont Saint-Michel. You may not know, but the Mont Saint-Michel is the third most visited site in France after Versailles and the Eiffel Tower. Um, it's a unique site. Um, we also have uh, Rouen, which is a beautiful city. Uh, down bottom right, you've got the Vol les Roses, Aromanche, of course, the D-Day landing beaches, and um, then we have beautiful Bayeux. I mean, just look at these photos. You can see that we really live in a beautiful part of France. It may not be the sunniest, but it really is a beautiful part. I really strongly and truly believe that Normandy is the most beautiful region in France. So this is what we're trying to do on a daily basis, is to make people understand that um, basically you don't have to go far to experience France at its best. We don't want people just, you know, coming off the ferry and heading down south. We want people to stay in Normandy and understand that there's so much to see and do here in Normandy. Here are just a few stats and facts. We have 350 miles of coastline and 310 miles of cycling routes. Now, cycling routes are really popular at the moment. More and more people you know, are getting on their bike and cycling. And we have over 300 miles of cycling routes in Normandy. We have three UNESCO World Heritage Sites, the Mont Saint-Michel, of course, Le Havre City Centre, and the Vauban Fortifications in saint valais -Augue. Um, the Granville Carnival, which is a great event, which takes place every February in Granville. Uh, the Bayeux Tapestry in Alençon are also um, UNESCO listed. I mean, the Alençon Lace, which is called Le, La Dentelle d'Alençon. Um, we certainly have some good restaurants in Normandy. There are a total of 28 Michelin-starred restaurants. And uh, you might not know this, but um, Rouen Cathedral is the tallest in France. And the whole city of Rouen actually has the second largest number of listed buildings and monuments outside Paris. And uh, for nature lovers, we also have four regional natural, natural parks in Normandy. You can move on. Yeah. So as I said, um, you know, um, a, a slogan I use a lot in the, in the UK is um, Normandy, France at its best, right on your doorstep. And these are just a few recent examples you see. Um, saint valais uh, which is a beautiful um, seaside village on the Cotentin Peninsula. Uh, it's a really interesting village, actually, because um, Tatiou Island is part of the village. And you can actually um, catch a really quirky, interesting amphibious craft, craft to, um, to get from the, the, um, the port to the island. And saint valais was voted France's favourite village in 2019. Then there's the GR21, um, which was voted France's favourite hiking trail last year. It follows the Alabaster coast. It crosses, uh, it goes from Le Tréport to Le Havre. It crosses Dieppe, it crosses Fécamp, it crosses Etretat, as you can see on the pic. It's a beautiful hiking trail, and uh, no wonder it was voted um, France's favorite hiking trail in 2020. 
Then we have uh, Dieppe Market, my hometown, which was voted uh, France's finest market last year too. A beautiful market which takes place every Saturday morning, which stretches over two kilometers. It really is a great uh, market to explore on Saturday mornings. Then you have a pick of David Gallien, uh, who's the head chef at the Jardin des Plumes in Giverny, a lovely restaurant, and he's the top chef winner last year. And then just a few months back, um, there's a bakery just out in Francqueville Saint Pierre called Odilis Normand, and it won the France's best bakery um, contest, which takes place on uh, the MC's TV show. So there you go. It's just a few examples over the past few years to show you, you know, that we've won a lot of titles, and there's so many great things going on in Normandy, and we've got some of the best sites, markets, and villages in France. Um, you may be aware too that there's an official label in France uh, called Les Plus Beaux Villages de France, which basically recognizes that um, some, some, of the, some of the villages which are truly beautiful. Uh, so there's an official label and we have six of these uh, villages in Normandy. You can see them on the map here. First of all, there's Barfleur on the Cotentin Peninsula, a beautiful fishing village. Then right down south on the border, there's saint seigneury le geray uh, it's a really tiny village, an artist retreat. Uh, it's a beautiful um, village which is uh, nestled in the middle of the lush Orne countryside. Then there's uh, Beuvron en Auge, which is, let's say, picture perfect Normandy. Really um, a, a lovely small village too, which is famous for its cider festival, uh, for its brocante, for its antique dealers. It's a lovely village. Then there are two villages in the Eure, uh, Le Bec et Loin, which also has a fantastic abbey and Lyon's La Forêt, where Madame Bovary film was shot. And then the latest one uh, to receive this official label is Vol les Roses. It's my personal favorite because it looks like a countryside village, yet it's by the sea. So you can explore the village and then you get to the seaside and enjoy all the pleasures of the seaside too. So there you go. I don't know if you've been to all of these villages, but if you can go and pay them a visit because they're all truly beautiful. We have six plus beaux villages de France in Normandy. So you might recognize this fella, um, David Hockney. So David Hockney, the, it's an interesting story. He was living in Los Angeles. And um, from what I understand, he sort of started um, growing tired of all the rules and regulations they were in California. So he said to his partner back, at the, back in 2019, well, let's move. And um, he came to Normandy a few years back. He traveled across Normandy for three or four days. He visited Le Havre, he visited Bayeux. He fell in love with the place, and so they decided with his partner to move to Normandy. So he now lives just outside, uh, just outside Beuvron en Auge, which is one of our prettiest villages. And uh, he lives in an old farmhouse. Um, he works there. He spent lockdown there last year. And during lockdown, he painted a series of, I think there's about a hundred of them, a hundred paintings, picturing uh, the arrival of spring in Normandy. And this is now, you see, the arrival of spring is now the name of the exhibition, which is on at the moment at the Royal Academy in London. It's called The Arrival of Spring 2020 Normandy. And he's really become one of our most famous new ambassadors. Um, he loves Normandy. I think he'll probably die here now, you see. Um, he's really happy to live here. He's a strong ambassador. Um, last month, too, you could see um, a digital display of one of his paintings in four major cities around the world, including New York, London, and Tokyo. So we're just really pr proud and blessed to have such a strong ambassador now, David Hockney, there you go. So what's new in Normandy? First of all, we have two new museums. Um, Les Franciscaines in Deauville. I know that Michael agrees with me here. It's a fantastic museum. It's actually so much more than a museum. It's a whole cultural complex, you see. It's housed in an old, a former uh, Franciscan convent, and that's why it's called Les Franciscaines. It was, a, it was a school at first, then it was a hospital, and now it's become a huge cultural complex, a huge cultural center. Uh, you have a media library, you have two museums, you have the André Ambourg Museum. André Ambourg, which was a painter who um, lived in Deauville and who painted hundreds and hundreds of works of art, a very eclectic, he has lots of different styles, and uh, just, before, um, just before she died, his wife basically gave all of his works to this, um, this new centre in Deauville. So you can um, see all of his works um, in the um, André Ambourg Museum. And there's also uh, a contemporary art um, museum 
along with a fab lab, along with a great restaurant. It really is a truly beautiful new cultural center. And just a few miles away from there, in Cabourg, there's the Villa du Temps Retrouvé. So Cabourg is a smaller, more intimate um, seaside resort. And uh, it's uh, basically Normandy's romantic capital. And this is where Marcel Proust uh, wrote his most famous novel, In Search of Lost Time. He wrote it at the Grand Hotel. And there's this new museum that's opened uh, called La Villa du Temps Retrouvé. Um, and uh, it's housed in one of the historic villas. It's a beautiful museum. It's a lot smaller than Les Franciscaines, but basically you can walk in the footsteps of Marcel Proust and step back into the Belle Époque era. So it's a really lovely place to discover too. These two new museums on the Flowered Coast. Then of course we have the British Normandy Memorial. Uh, Michael was there for the official opening on the 6th of June. Uh, there wasn't a memorial for British soldiers in Normandy, and now there is one. Uh, a lot of efforts uh, were displayed for this, and uh, here we have it now. It's in Vers sur Mer. As you can see, it's a beautiful memorial. Um, you go and go and visit it. I mean, it's really moving. It's a lovely place. Uh, it's right. You can see the sea. It's, it's next to the seaside in Vers sur Mer. Um, it, people have been waiting for this for years and years and years. It's finally here. So if you can, go to go and see this British Norm Normandy Memorial. And I'm pretty sure that when the Brits are able to travel again, many of them will come and visit this new site. Um, we did have a bit of good news though um, today. Um, France is on UK's amber list. And uh, now the Brits who come over to France won't have to self-isolate when they go back to, to the UK. So that's good news. And we really hope that, you know, in the coming weeks, and months, uh, Brits will be able to come back to, to Normandy. And just finish with a few hidden gems because I'm, um, you know, I've shown you the highlights, I've shown you what's new. And I just wanted to show you too a few hidden gems you've probably never heard of. Um, top left, we have uh, les vaches noires, les falaises des vaches noires, which actually translates as the dark cows. They're pretty much unique in France, really dark cliffs, which are uh, really beautiful. Um, prehistoric site, site, you can find many fossils there. Uh, and these uh, dark cliffs are located halfway between Villers-sur-Mer and Ulgat. Then in the middle, you have this really quirky and colorful church, which is actually nicknamed the Living and Speaking Church. You'll find it in Le Minil Bondouin, which is a tiny village in the Orne. And um, it's the, act the actual priest uh, at the beginning of the 20th century who decided to decorate the whole church inside and out. It's a beautiful, quirky church to explore. Then you have um, the funicular in Le Treport. This is a great experience. It's the only one in Europe which crosses the cliffs. It crosses the cliffs, uh, a tunnel. It's, a, it's really a really great experience. It's free too. You can park your car on the cliff tops and take the funicular down to the old town, to the old fisherman's district. So that's a great experience too. Then bottom right, you have the Bon Vouloir Tower. I know that loads of Brits love Donfront, but nobody really knows of this tower, which is located five miles away from Donfront. It has something Rapunzelesque about it. So it's really a really interesting site to discover too. Uh, then the bottom, you have the Biville Dunes. We actually have beautiful sand dunes in Normandy. Biville is on the Cotentin Peninsula. And then uh, bottom left, you have the Chêne d'Alouville, which is the oldest, the oldest oak tree in France. And it's a really interesting site too, because there's a staircase, as you can see, that takes you to the top of, the, of this tree. It's like an actual faraway tree. And um, the, this tree houses two tiny chapels, and you can actually enter the tree trunk to, to see these two tiny chapels. So there you go, Here's just, these are just a, fitting, um, a few hidden gems. So um, there you go, basically, that's Normandy tourism in, in a nutshell, but just once again to show you that we live in an incredible region. I mean, I've been working for the Tourist Board for five years now, and every day I discover new things. We're blessed to live in this, such a beautiful region. I hope, I hope you can all be strong ambassadors too of tourism in Normandy. Thanks. Uh, I'm sure that you can detect that uh, Ben's enthusiasm is very precious in our promotional efforts. And I think it's interesting as well to uh, to see that we're trying to look out and illustrate the, the what we call Normandy secrets. In fact, that there's a an application that we've created called secretnormand.com and normandysecrets.com, where uh, these hidden gems that uh, Ben and others and the tourist offices in Normandy discover are actually described and and shared with with our visitors. So 
we, yes, we're proud to promote the Mont Saint Michel and Giverny and Etretat, but we are deliberately trying to promote areas that are less well known and so that everyone can benefit as much as possible from the economic the value of tourism. Um, another promotional effort I want to we want to show you this evening before we open our discussions is um, our efforts to promote ourselves to to the to the UK. Um, we have, um, of, of course, Normandy Tourism has normandytourism.org as its main UK website and English speaking website. But last year we created a new broader promotional website called choisirlanormandie.fr choisirlanormandie.fr and as you can well imagine we're coming up with an English version of that which we're going to call choosenormandie.com and if you tap in choosenormandie.com into your websites you can come across this work in progress that we're trying to develop and get going at the moment because we feel that we need to have a decent website that offers visitors a first orientation and, and creates hopefully good first impressions for people who are just curious about Normandy, whether it's to visit or to study or to invest or to come and live. This website is something we're working on and uh, we hope to be able to use it effectively in the forthcoming weeks and months uh, as the main landing page and the main call to action for different events. In October, it was meant to be in June, but it was postponed now till October. We, with the uh, Normandy Development Agency, are intending to host a week, a Choose Normandy week for all English speaking people, curious about Normandy as a potential area for investment or to live, work and play. And we'll be running um, in, from the 11th of October, for the week starting the 11th of October, we'll be running um, every day two webinars or seminars like this one, where we will be presenting different areas of the Normandy economy um, and different investment opportunities, along with the opportunity to see different videos and discuss with people like yourselves who've made the choice to actually choose Normandy as a place to live and work. This could be the start of something. This could be the start of something. It's gonna be in October, it's gonna be running for a week, but it could be the start of something bigger that may grow year upon year. And it's something we really want to explore um, with yourselves, the British community living and working in Normandy. Maybe it's the time we should start thinking about uh, reinforcing economic, cultural, even sporting links, and maybe imagining some form of Anglo-French or Anglo-Norman event to help reaffirm those special links that exist between Normandy and the UK, and to make sure that post-Brexit, Normandy isn't forgotten, and that um, both the Norman community and the French community here, as well as the attitude on the other side of the channel, remains one of openness and exchange and, uh, and collaboration. Um, on the website, choosenormandy.com, we also have this ambition, which is to have a little rubric on the website called Ask a Norman, Demandez à un Norman. It's working already in French, on the French site, choisirlanormandie.fr, where people who have a question uh, can actually pose a question to a, a Normandy resident who may be specialist in the different areas of activity. But we're trying to get together and we've already identified Norman people who are prepared to spend a bit of time and a bit of energy answering the questions of uh, different people on, on, on the website who are curious about a certain subject and want to know more about a certain subject. That's one way that the British community could become involved by maybe being prepared to be uh, contacted if necessary to help steer people in the right direction or simply share their own experience about living and working in France and developing things in France or their own special interests that they've managed to develop effectively here in, in, in Normandy. The other thing that we obviously want to encourage as well is participation in Anglo-French events and we have the good fortune, we have the good fortune, I hope, the perfect post-Brexit antidote uh, between the 8th and 15th of August, if Covid will allow us, we will be hosting the arrival for the first time ever, the arrival of the Rolex Fastnet race. Fastnet, a, 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 a maritime event that's been taking place for almost a hundred years, 
has decided not to go to Plymouth, but knows that they will be, they'll get an even better welcome by finishing this important race in their calendar in Cherbourg. And we hope that it will be a terrific first edition. This could well be the first time we come out of COVID, cross fingers, we can actually uh, have a major event, a maritime event taking place in Cherbourg. It will be great to welcome you all there. And normally Attractivity, our agency, will be hosting a special event and uh, we'll be hosting a stand and we look forward to, to meeting you. And perhaps we could organise things so you could have a special way of participating in the Rolex Class Net race for those who are interested. This is now where we want to open the floor to your good selves. I think what we're offering tonight is in this post-Brexit world, maybe it's right and important that your host region, you've made a, a lifetime choice to invest time and energy, a good part of your lives here in Normandy. The Normandy region is interested in extending out its network of Normandy ambassadors what are normally ambassadors? There's nothing too official about it, to be honest. It's people who love their region and are prepared to spend a little time and a little energy sharing their passion for Normandy with others and staying in contact with us as the coordinating agency and being prepared to listen out and look out for special events and be prepared to talk about it amongst your community. And for those who are perhaps the most enthusiastic, we'll be happy to spend time sitting with you trying to imagine what type of events we could work together to help promote the Normandy cause, to help promote the strong image and reputation for Normandy and help develop our links both with the UK and internationally. I think what we're extending to you this evening, first of all, is an opportunity for you to further integrate yourselves, if it's your desire, with French businesses, French contacts, regional contacts, Normal people who are already passionate about their region, either on an individual level or normally businesses that use this Normandy brand in their corporate communications. It's the opportunity for you to have a special introduction to all these positive thinking Normandy businesses and individuals. So I think from a network point of view, joining our network of Normandy ambassadors would make great sense if that is what you require. If you're happy in your own little community and you've, you've developed here in Normandy and, and life is rosy like that, well, that's fine. And, and we hope that you continue to enjoy Normandy. And maybe all we can hope for is that you're interested in some of the material we have on our website and you're happy to talk about that when you have visiting friends and relatives to make sure that people have a, a great time when they come and visit you. But for others, of, others um, in Normandy who have a business, but for those who are wanting to develop new projects, maybe joining our network of normally ambassadors could make great sense to get your particular line of business or your particular activity or your particular project better understood by the local businesses around you or the local authority around you. Many of the local authorities, majority of local authorities, as you can imagine, work very closely with us. So we're extending an, an official Sign a welcome to say, come aboard and become a Normandy ambassador. Does this make sense? Um, I hope so. Uh, the key thing for us after this meeting is that at least you begin to follow our activity on social media, which has become extremely important in terms of communications and communicating our ambitions and sticking together and exchanging ideas. You have Emily Bonnet's email address there at the bottom. She's absolutely key, is Emily. And I hope that those of you who are enthused about the idea of joining our network, take down Emily's email address, e.bonnet at normandy-attractivity.fr. And if you manage to write that down without making a spelling mistake, you deserve to be a Normandy ambassador. We'll have to change that and make it simpler, I think. But let's open up discussion now. We've talked to you for about 45 minutes. You've been very, very patient. This idea of joining this network of Normandy ambassadors, does it make sense to you? Are any of you interested? Now in the chat line, Chris, has anybody already been making comments? Let me try and get the whole gallery. Let me try and stop sharing this uh, PowerPoint <coughs> and try and visualize everyone that's still with us. You've been very kindly, 33 of you are still here. So we haven't lost you all, which is great. 
Who's raised their hand or who's, uh, Chris, is there anything in the chat that we want to talk about straight away? Chris? Um, sorry, not not straight away. Um, there's been some, some very interesting comments, uh, but there's uh, no one who has a direct question at the moment. Yes, there is. Maybe you could ask for some. Brilliant. <laughs> Tina, welcome aboard. Hello there. Um, thanks for the presentation. I'm still a bit unclear about what you actually want to do. Having run voluntary projects before and trained volunteers and things like that, um, mostly the university basis, but also with sort of large um, organisations. Um, you say it's a sort of ambassadors and obviously it's volunteering. So I just wonder how you go about any sort of training. From what you said so far, it's just sort of email in, offer to do it. There's no mention about a consistency of approach or how you know that people will be um, sort of working professionally, if you like, with people. It, it's So could you tell us a bit more about those plans, if any? Well, Tina, to be really quite open and honest with you, um, we have deliberately left this ambassador project extremely open to the uh, energy and voluntarism of each of each individual it's, it's very much what you make of it at one end we've got um, some people it, most of the work that we've been doing we're focusing on is the running these clubs abroad in overseas countries and um, they have been very very different in in Sydney in Australia uh, there are 35 people that meet up um, at least three times a year that share a, a, a WhatsApp um, social media link to exchange uh, ideas and keep in touch, that look out for business opportunities, uh, that welcome new Norman people when they're arriving in Australia, and they meet up, as we encourage them to do on the 6th of June every year, to have a picnic for peace, uh, having sourced good Normandy products with our help and are there basically as a form of solidarity and help for expats in their community. Expats. That's, that's, that's in Sydney, that's in Australia. Um, in Singapore, it's very much the same thing. It's an expat community. That sorry, are, I don't think we're expats, we've moved here. We're immigrants, we're not expats. Not, it's, I'm sorry, I just have a feeling that it's a really smacks of colonialism, all this coming over here and telling the French how to do something. And I, I just don't think you're organised or no, I'm not interested at all. Very unimpressed. All right, Tina switched off. <laughs> what we're saying is that we have focused our attention on developing an expat community with no colonialist ambitions whatsoever, I'd like to reassure everybody. Um, and that's where this, it's been making sense to develop Normandy pride and Normandy identity and Normandy solidarity. Here in the UK, sorry, here in Normandy for the expat community, things are completely on an open sheet and a, and a white blank piece of paper. And it's for us to develop ourselves, whether it makes sense to uh, get British UK residents over here who believe in their region to work with us in trying to promote Normandy more effectively in, in a way that we want. It's an open book. We don't have any predetermined um, method of uh, running a, a Normandy network or, 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 or British people living here in Normandy. We're simply inviting British people who've made that lifestyle choice to come out here and stay here for the, for the, for the, for the, for the long term. We're simply inviting them to join the, ne the Normandy network and to take you know, Normandy's promotion a bit seriously and, and, and have a special conduit for your own ideas and allowing you the chance to have an influence on the way Normandy promotes itself. Now, either that's of interest to you or it's not. We're not, we're not forcing anybody. And Tina, who's obviously not impressed at all, well, never mind. You know, we don't want to go against the, the intentions or force anybody to do anything. <clears throat> it's an open invitation this evening to work with us on trying to influence the way Normandy promotes itself and trying to allow you the opportunity to have even better contacts in Normandy so that you can make the most of your own life and your own lifestyle choice over here. Does that make sense to everyone? Or is uh, everyone joining Tina and saying goodbye straight away without listening to it? Could I just ask a kind of question? I mean, it does make sense and I'm not with Tina, um, but I was wondering whether you had to be British to join 
or, you know, because often um, I do have British citizenship, but I'm a South African by birth. And just because I speak English, people automatically make the assumption that you have to be British. So just that angle is, you know, I mean, you talk about internationally, but if you could just. Uh, now, I'm afraid I can't tell your, your Christian name because it's Nikib, and I doubt whether it's Nikib, your, your Christian name. Um, yes, my first name is Nikki, and my surname right, is Nikki. I got you. Sorry, Nikki. Beg your pardon. <laughs> Nikki, um, there is absolutely uh, no requirement to be British to join our cause whatsoever. Anyone who's passionate about our Normandy from any corner of the earth with any accent and with any colour of skin is more than welcome to join us. Um, so, no, we just simply felt that we don't have enough English speakers within our community. We feel that with Brexit, and we know that there's a strong British community living in Normandy, we felt, ah, let's just try and reach out to this audience <laughs> with the help of Britline, who obviously have a fairly privileged contact with many of you. So that's what's leading us tonight. We feel that there's a, a potential uh, for, for having British speaking Normandy lovers to join the cause. And you'd be more than welcome, Nikki, absolutely. Um, hi, it's Julie here. Um, Hello, Julie. So, yeah, just I, I just learned loads about Normandy, which was brilliant, um, and didn't realise it had quite so many good attractions. So that's you know a great um, positive start for me. And it, yeah, I think uh, again, I'm not with Tina at all. I think it sounds like it's a real open um, opportunity to um, to both you know assist yourselves and, and Normandy with its promotions, but also to get something back in terms of networking which I mean I've been here three years but obviously the last 14 months have been a difficult time to meet people here and to get Absolutely. involved in stuff so it feels um and, and no doubt there's there's you know it's not coincidence in your timing of, of hopefully pandemic um coming to an end we all hope um but yeah to, to to actually get um involved in some stuff is what I'm looking for um great. yeah so yeah I'm very keen and I, I am um you know fortunate enough to have time to do that as well so um yeah just it sounds very positive and very, I totally get the idea of it being completely blank sheet of paper let's see where it goes rather than a very defined thing that you're trying to develop so yeah Julie thank you for that I think you've co you've cottoned on straight away as to what we're trying to do <laughs> um we have no preconceived uh, uh master plan <laughs> We just feel it's the right time and it's an important time for your host region to reach out to you and to allow you to opportunities to integrate even more with uh, uh, yeah the, 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 the different the, the French word here is a lovely word les forces vives so it's the sort of the makers and the shakers in Normandy we're, we're trying to get together and here we're extending a, our arm out to English, speak, English speaking people who, who want to have even stronger links. And, and you're right, this, this has been a difficult time for everybody. Um, both COVID and Brexit now gives us greater impetus and greater rationale to, uh, yeah, try to have a, a, a really strong Anglo French community that work, works together here in Normandy. I think that we could do something that demarcates us from other regions of France. I mean, it's right that Normandy should be doing this. That's, we, we feel very strongly in that way. But it's for us to work together. And Julie, it'd be just terrific if we could, you know, um, as others this evening, hook up, exchange email addresses, uh, meet up properly. It'd be great to meet people physically and have a little brainstorm session together as to what we could maybe do in the future. And uh, are there any types of events that we could help organise with you or that you'd be happy to do or lead on or blank sheet of paper? We don't have any preconceived yeah. <laughs> ideas other than the conviction that uh, we should be exploring this potential. Sounds good. Thanks, yeah. Julie. Yeah, we're, we're keen to uh, explore. Great. Yeah, sorry. Yeah, hi. Yeah, thanks a lot. Really enjoyed the presentation from uh, the two of you and uh, like Julie, learning a lot more things about Normandy that um, we have we weren't aware of before. And uh, so we're, we, we've had a property here for a few years, but decided like a lot of others to uh, get over it before, uh, before uh, Brexit so we can we just been to do our fingerprinting today, so we you. so you've got your new your new identity cards to show off. Absolutely, on. absolutely. Yeah. And um, I've been a chef in the UK since I was sixteen, and 
worked in different areas of the food business and we're near Mont Saint Michel and right. we're um, I think we're we're planning right. to open a, a business next year um, to sort of like Chambre d'Oak, but also to expand how I can work with um, Normandy produce and create, you know, sort of more interesting dishes perhaps, uh, but being sympathetic to the authenticities and uh, and to sort of grow ourselves and, and make our own products. So for us in our position, you know, there's something that we can sort of get from, from, okay. from here, but we also yeah. can, uh, give back as well and really you know promote ourselves in the village yeah. that we're in um you know um so you know it's new to us but anything that um you know we can glean from this forum and help with the cause of um promoting normandy then we'd like to be part of it well that's great chris and your partner's name sorry chris as uh, well chris so both chris so <laughs> chris and chris chris, chris. <laughs> yeah. well that's great chris yeah okay but thanks again thank uh, you oh, that's, that's great and we do that's have as you can imagine very strong links with um what the, all of the, the 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 agricultural sector and the um, yeah. food product sector in normandy you, you've probably seen the label saveur de normandie yeah yeah, yeah. It actually yeah. integrates our, our normandy brand in it we have we, we work we're as close as two ticks together with saveur de normandie and i'm sure that they would uh you know, be more than happy to to, to share things with, with yourselves. Oh, and fabulous, fabulous, yeah. Necessary. Yeah, fabulous. awesome. Okay, well, Thank I can, you. yeah, drop some emails to Emily and keep Great. in contact. Yeah. yeah. Thank you to the two Chrises. Anyone yeah, else raising you. their hands? Go on, don't be shy. Hi. Um, hello. I've lived, hello, I'm called Anne, as you can tell. Hello, uh, Anne. I've I've lived here for nearly 10 years. Great. And I struggle to know, I don't want anything back from this. Right. But I I'm quite happy to contribute because I love Normandy. Um, but I don't know what a retired civil servant can offer you really. Oh, at the man. moment, at the moment I do stuff like um I translate uh tourist brochures for the tourist office in Falaise for nothing because whoever they get to do it the English is appalling absolutely <laughs> so I I just I do that for them and I volunteer at the medieval and things like that but this sort of network because well my my contacts in the UK are really limited and they all know what Normandy's like because we keep making them come and look at it um but so i'm happy to help but i have no idea what i can offer you you you'd be surprised Anne, and and and, and don't worry about that but actually taking the time to help falaise improve uh, its communications in english is already a, a more than welcome gesture we believe in falaise as, as a destination and the chateau yeah. is well worth a visit you need to you need to vote for the chateau yeah. though yeah absolutely absolutely everybody it's in a competition at the moment quite, of, uh, a France yeah. TV competition to be yes. uh, the most loved monument in France, and, and, and Normandy's candidate is Falaise. So yeah, you're right. So Let's all get behind Falaise. It's up against the Pont du Gard and various other places, but it's infinitely superior and very, very <laughs> English. Well, I think and that Anne is showing signs, strong signs of being a fairly natural ambassador. <laughs> 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 I have a fabulous cartoon that says Fournisseur de Roi d'Angleterre depuis 1066. Oh, well, there you go. <laughs> Everybody has to vote. There's no, 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 no need to invent any marketing slogans. We've got it already. That's perfect. Yeah. And we'd be more than welcome to, to, to have you with us. And, and I'm sure that in discussion that some ideas would emerge. And, and, and I'm sure that your 10 years of experience would be of value. Anybody else? likes to chip in come on there's there's quite a few of you still with us yes i think pamela uh pa pamela i think you have your your microphone on mute which yes, okay Hello, can you pamela. hear me can you hear me now yes i can hear you okay um i'm a grandmother and i've been here two years and i think it's the most beautiful part of the world. I've also lived for a long time in Italy. Um, 
the only thing that's putting me off terribly, which is a bit like England, is all the rain we've had recently. But let's Absolutely. just hope, let's just hope it's this year and it's not going to happen again. But the thing that interests me most, it doesn't really uh, something that I can do. I have um, forty-year-old children with grandchildren, and they are working in different parts of the world um, because they don't have to work in an office, and so therefore. If you had two children, let's say, and you, you don't have to work in London, you can work from here. Why not bring your children here, educate them, perfect schools everywhere, and live in an environment which is so green and so beautiful, so healthy. And you can still run wild. The children can run wild all over the place. You can go on wonderful trips everywhere. So to advertise it to people who can work from a distance, I think it's... A perfect opportunity for young couples. I think you're absolutely right, Pamela, and I think that um, this whole COVID experience, where their employers have had no choice but to adapt to people working from home and working digitally, it's actually reinforced this phenomena of people being able to choose more easily where they live. And um, Normandy, uh, you know, as I said at the beginning, well placed geographically in between London and Paris. Uh, yet able to offer, you know, a high quality of life and the quality environment, access to lovely countryside, good products, access to the sea. Hey, it's, it's got a lot of things going for it. And I think that uh, with digital communications giving that greater flexibility, um, Normandy should position itself well and should be doing quite well. I'm actually running at the moment a network of small to medium sized towns in Normandy who the, are all agreeing and all realizing that, wow, perhaps they, perhaps they should be doing something more, perhaps they should be doing, making greater efforts to welcome um, new populations and young families from Paris. And I'm working with them to try and work out how they can improve their different services and facilities to be able to attract young families from the Paris area who obviously you know, probably didn't enjoy uh, lockdown uh, in, in, a, in their 50 square meter flat or apartment in Paris and the opportunity to have a, a comfortable house and access to a green space and garden and normally is becoming more important but I think to the many Brits as well who are now thinking about well coming out of Covid what do we really want in our lives what really matters what is important maybe as you say we can actually start developing arguments that make sense to people who are mobile and people can who can remain connected digitally and actually choose another, what they another thing young couples in england are finding it really they can't get on the house ladder or what do you call it house buying ladder because houses are so expensive Absolutely. in certainly in the south of england but also in in further north but here you can buy the most lovely properties for very little money um, well, I consider it very little money, and I've lived in different places. Um, and also, you have such a wonderful green space and historic value to it. Well, there you go. I've written that down. We've got our, our arguments already sorted and in order. Thank you, Pamela. But you're right. You're absolutely right. And we will be working. Um, what you can imagine is that we're trying to work um, more closely with the French towns so that they realise this and that they begin to want to actually uh, promote themselves a little more effectively to make the most of these opportunities. What you're describing is almost a no-brainer to, to, to many people from outside Normandy, but within Normandy itself, uh, who many local authorities have found it difficult to put themselves in the shoes mentally of people who they want to attract. And it's all about a, an adopting an, an appropriate marketing culture to uh, make sure that uh, Normandy does attract people. What's extraordinary in Normandy, and this is something that shocked me when I arrived, was to discover that over the last 40 years, Normandy's population has actually been in decline. And it's only been um, redressed by um, uh, the, the population aging and a more aged population in the last 10 years. I don't think that's normal for a beautiful area in between London and Paris. There's something amiss there. Um, while other regions like Brittany, where I was working before, has been growing by as much as 20,000 people, new people a year. Here, there are still pockets of Normandy where their population is in decline, people having difficulty attracting med uh, general practitioners, 
there are many, many areas in Normandy where there are terrific jobs that are going. They just can't find the people to do, to, to get them to do these jobs. That's not right. And uh, this is, these are the sort of issues that we're trying to, uh, trying to address. But your perspective on it, uh, Pamela, and, and the contacts of your children and their grandchildren, it's all important to have I... different perceptions of Normandy. One other thing, one, my son and daughter-in-law who've been living in Zurich and then Paris working there, they've just emigrated to Montreal in Canada. And she is wo still working for the company that she was working for in Zurich. You know, she's been working, uh, you know, digitally or whatever you call it. Yeah. Um, perfectly well um, from another part of the world. No, the technology, the technology is there now, and hopefully by the end of 2023, the whole of Normandy will be covered um, and will have high speed uh, digital connections, as, which is an absolute requirement now. But both the technology and the flexibility of employers allows, the, allows these ideas to happen. You know, what, what, it's not pie in the sky anymore. You can actually choose where you want to live. But I think that will obviously place um, a stress on um, on education and the schools and on colleges, and I'm trying to encourage Director R and uh, the region here to allow and um, give the opportunity for an international curriculum. Um, my children in Caen are, ben are benefiting from the Option Baccalauréat International, which is available in in Caen. I'd love that to be available in more towns as well in France, and that that would then more towns in Normandy, and that could be as well something that would reassure people and, and encourage them to make that step and set up their families over here. Mm. Thanks, Pamela. That, are there any other people who'd like to comment this evening? Are we... Just, if it's okay to say, um, Hi, Lara. I, I currently have the vast majority of my clients are still in the UK and I uh, work from, uh, from Normandy um, and have to sometimes go backwards and forwards, but it's such an easy way of living. I have a far better quality of life living here. I first visited Normandy when I was 11. It was my first time out of the UK and I fell in love with it then and I've been in love with it ever since. And the idea that I can work just as easily here and live in a, such a beautiful place um, and because of the way the world works, it's very easy and I'm only in the UK, you know, obviously when COVID's not around, for three or four days a month. And the rest of the time I work here where I can wander out into my beautiful garden. And you know, so I'd always be happy to talk to people about the difference it can make to your quality of life and how very simple it is to do. Oh, and actually, that's really it's great. not achievable in other places in France, but it's very achievable here because I have access to the rail, I have access to the ferries, I have access to airports should I need it. But I also have, you know, I mean, I have to say my internet's a bit rubbish still at the moment, but it's workable um, and it's well worth investing in because the quality of my life is just incredible here. Um, and I'm able to also work here as a, an, an, uh, an auto entrepreneur, which has been really, really simple to do. Um, so yeah, it, I'm always really happy. And also I am in London four or five days of every month and would be happy to talk to people there as well about why they should consider relocating to somewhere that is, as you say, between Paris and London and offers them and their families a totally better quality of life as it does ours. Well, Lara, you're living proof that what we're saying isn't just theory and, it, and it's reality. And I'd love to extend this invitation to Lara, we'd love to come and film you <laughs> and interview you so that you could get that down on, on videotape so we could use it to encourage people that it is not just theory and not just promotional publicity but actually uh very very oh, real what you're saying i'd love to you can come eat my chickens that's great <laughs> <laughs> who else has got chickens that want this oh. <laughs> hello who's that laura hello yes hi hi michael i uh, just want to say firstly thank you for the presentation it's been really interesting very motivational as well just really wanted to um on the back of what Pamela and yourself have said, um, I've been working locally with uh, the um, estate agents, Leggett Immobilier, and we have been inundated with inquiries from people from Paris 
who will want to buy properties in Normandy. Mm. Um, one of the main reasons is it's so accessible here. To get mm. here from Paris is two and a half hours. Um, and they're looking either to have a second home here or to move here, as you say, because they've been working from home anyway and to get a better quality of life. So that just backs up what, you, what yourself and Pamela have been saying. Mm. But thank you for the presentation. I'd be very interested to work with you. Just a thought, you've got the Rolex Fastnet race, yeah. race coming up, hopefully. Hopefully. If that is the first main event uh, this year, would it be a nice opportunity to introduce the Normandy ambassadors um, at that time and Absolutely. invite us to come along and say here we are no that's right that's yeah. right we have every intention of doing that oh every good good. That. good okay thank you very much thank you laura chris in the chat are there any other no, there's been some really interesting messages it's um it sounds really positive i think there's a uh, a great feel around this uh, this presentation. Uh, I find everyone's really enthusiastic and uh, really willing to to give uh, give something and to uh, to to be involved. Um, so it's uh, uh, really really positive, really positive. Well, that's great. We we probably lost Tina, I think. But apart from Tina, I think we've got everyone on board just about. Um, look, listen. I think you understand where we're coming from. It's an open invitation to. To get involved according to your own aspirations and your own energy, energy, your own time, but at least um, it's an open invitation to stay in contact. And we will, uh, if you leave, if you could contact Emily on uh, e.bonnet at normandie attractivite.fr. We've got to simplify that, Emily. It's too long, that email address. It really is too long. Um, if you could leave your mail with Emily, we would love to get in touch with you. And I would be very keen to try and meet up. I mean, that, that, that would be great. Um, but my understanding is we've got enough material and enthusiasm to at least have another meeting of this form to talk a bit more about uh, the different types of events and, and different types of activities we could be thinking about. But our first port of call is please contact Emily if you're interested to know more and work with us. And um, we will be, we're very encouraged by the, the feedback we've had uh, this evening. Emily, are you okay? I'm okay. And I promise to work on my English Good for <laughs> to you. be able to talk with you. <laughs> Her written English, I'm already very impressed by. Very impressed by. So you can write to Emily in French or you can write in English or you can write in franglais, whatever you wish. You can even start writing in Norman, but I think that's a bit too much to ask. Don't do that. <laughs> Thank you, Simon. <laughs> <coughs> okay, I think we'll leave it there for this evening. Thanks very much for your time. Um, please leave your contact and um, let's hope that we can start something that could be of, of interest both to us and will help our beautiful region develop in a harmonious way and, uh, and help us all get out of this horrible COVID situation. Cross fingers that we can manage this virus. And I do hope that you all got vaccinated twice and that you're going to very shortly. It's key to everything. Have a great summer and we'll be in touch very shortly. And don't Thank forget you. to contact Emily. Thank you all very much. Thank you, bye-bye. Thank you very much, Michael. Thank you, bye-bye. I appreciate it, thanks. Thank Thanks. That's good. Thanks, everyone. Bye. Thanks. Bye. Bye. <laughs>